My dad was an artist. He taught me to observe. He lived in the deep country. I was used to being alone. It was natural to look at the weather, to look at the sky. And Dad was very good. Yes, he, he was always noticing which way the wind was blowing and what was happening to the leaves, how they were growing. And he'd notice when the migratory birds arrived and when they left. How the thing comes and goes with the seasons. And because I was uh, devoted to farming from before I could walk, I think, I used to say I came into this world to be a farmer. <laughs> I, mean, I, was just, I just loved all my childhood books were on farming, all my toys were animals. We had compulsory chapel. We'd have to go to chapel twice a day and say our prayers the morning and evening beside our bed. So I very soon began to find a, a safety in what I might call prayer. But I was really desperate for space. I'd look out of the window at the, at the trams rattling by out street, outside in the dirty streets of Sheffield and long to be elsewhere. It was also the beginnings of awareness of what was then called the third world. This uh, resonated with me. And so I went out to South America to uh, make the world a better place. At that time, they were giving away grants of a thousand hectares of virgin land in the jungles of Bolivia to anyone who would go and settle them and clear the jungle. I saw myself as an immature young man trying to improve the lives of these local Indians, many of whom were much older and wiser than I was. And it was after some success, but a lot of unsuccess, it seems to me that the little voice said to me to make whole be whole. I'd been reading a bit of philosophy, but this voice just seemed to me to mean something. So I came home when my time was over, and I looked for and found a school of meditation. And I started to meditate. I was 26 years old. And I remember the first time I meditated, I was sitting in uh, the busy station in London, St Pancras Station waiting room because I had to catch the train, late night train back home to feed my animals next morning. And I meditated and it just opened up like that. And I realized that the space that I loved, this space, the space I'd loved in the Andes and had already seen in the outback of Australia, I'd had a taste of deserts and the ocean, this wonderful space where I always felt better. That space was within me. Oh my God, do you know, just in that, you couldn't have had a less congenial place for your first time to meditate. And it just opened up and I realized I no longer had to travel the world to search for the freedom and the mountains and the deserts I longed for. I didn't even have to come up here. It was all within me. And that's how I started to meditate. And I was lit up, I can tell you. I'd been taught uh, Christianity at school, compulsory. It was all, you know, there's no choice about it then. And uh, I'd, I'd heard about the kingdom of God. And I suddenly thought, my God, this is what they're talking about. It's real. It's not just words. <laughs> I don't have to believe it. It's just real. It's just it. And uh, so I fell in love with meditation. And I've been practicing uh, ever since. And uh, <laughs> I've had a long life. I've been a farmer. I've been many things. I've traveled widely. I've done all sorts of things. But uh, this meditation I've practiced morning and evening. I've hardly missed for all these years. And I still do it now. And uh, I really consider this to be my work. I've done that uh, every day, every morning, every evening, for the last 22 years, believe it or not. <laughs> you need to be pretty desperate <laughs> to do it as I've done it all my life. But I love it, early morning, especially when the stars are shining in winter. And this is spirituality made practical. The experience of spirit, which is that, this expansion beyond the physical body and the thinking process is really mind, body, spirit. That's what it's all about. Meditation is, is looking into spirit, is discovering the realm of spirit within ourselves. Infinite love 
infinite fulfillment is what you might call our real home. This is where we come from. And somehow we left it, we lost paradise. And we've fallen into this world. What do I mean by fallen? We fall in consciousness. Because you see, this infinite vision is really a higher level of consciousness. When the town is full of people, the market is all busy, the cars and people talking. If you just climb a hill, you walk up, you leave all that behind, that cacophony of chaos. You walk up here and it's still. It's quiet and there's space. There's peace. Hmm? There is disturbance. There is, here is peace. It's simply a matter of levels of consciousness. You see, simply, we, we've gone down the hill. We got immersed in the market. We've forgotten what's up here. And that's what meditation is. It's simply a technique for realizing higher levels of consciousness. You see, this is when you try to put the infinite into, into words or limitation. It's like trying to put, put the sky into a jam pot, isn't it? It doesn't work. You can't do it. The, infinite, the, the intellect is very small, really, compared to the infinite. It really is. It's just, you know, when you're in thought and lost in thought, it just seems everything. When you get beyond thought, it's just like a, just like clouds. There's no, there's no need to worry about them. You know, like most people, I took my thoughts very seriously, especially when I was unhappy. It's not that easy, but uh, people say that, oh, not feeling well today, very well today. Ducky, terrible weather, isn't it? Feel under the weather, we say. Well, that's how it is. And what do you do when you go to the airport and get in an aeroplane? Hmm? Even on the most miserable winter day, goodness me, you go through the clouds and it's, it's there again, isn't it? This lovely space. And you look down and see the clouds and then, if you haven't forgotten them, <laughs> poor people under the cloud. And you begin to understand a lot about the human condition. It's a marvellous demonstration. Well, that's meditation. Meditation is just an aeroplane for taking you through the clouds of the mind. And what are these clouds? Well, they're thoughts, of course. And they play their part. Of course they have. Where would we be without clouds? But uh, the trouble is, when you get lost in them and you forget about this, then, of course, you're not free, are you? You're, you're, you're imprisoned in this world of thinking. And you're not fulfilled. And you know there's something else. And you look here, there, and everywhere. But usually you look in the realm of thought and more things, man-made things. And of course, none of it really works. This is the human condition, lost in thought. Meditation is a great help because it's one of the keys of what happens is that you usually, not always, feel better, uh, strangely enough. You know, here is our problems, me and my problems. And even a little bit of meditation helps us do that. So there's a certain sort of space created. It's obvious when you come up here, isn't it? You don't have to be a professional meditator to see it. You look at these walkers that come up here. They're sort of relieved of their burdens, aren't they? They feel, they're usually, not always, but usually happy. You know, they've forgotten to think. <laughs> They leave it all behind. You know, anybody that takes a dog out for a walk usually feels better for it, don't they? Another word for spirit is light. God is light. There's no weight there. And in the light you see, don't you? And in the darkness you don't see, but well, not as well. So, you see, the human condition, lost in thought, is, is really a state of darkness or ignorance. The wisdom of man is foolishness to God. Human knowledge is ignorance. Wisdom or faith is at, is at a higher level when you begin to function from here rather than from here. It's like two worlds, really. And if you long sufficiently for truth, for whatever it is, love or peace or, or fulfillment in true knowledge, you will gradually find like a sort of compass within yourself that you've been led in this direction. And once you begin to get a glimpse of this, you begin to say, oh gosh, that's what it's all about. 
that's what's wrong. But then you see, you have a few moments of this, and of course you're pulled back, the habits, the conditioning, the what's in it for me, all this sort of stuff, it, it, it pulls you back into this world of thought and problems and darkness. And that's why it's so essential once you start this journey to keep practicing, Practice, practice, and each time when you practice, you don't always get this opening, but you do, and you get little moments of light, like little grains of sugar leading on from one to the other, and gradually you begin to figure it out, you begin to understand what it's all about, and why man is lost, and once you begin to get that understanding, you get the bit between your teeth, and you, uh, and you don't look back so much. I went to a school of meditation in London and I stayed with them for 20 years. I used to go down and uh, I was very well taught. I was given a mantra. Now what's a mantra? You're given a sound which seems like a, a meaningless sound and you just repeat this sound. Now the attention is normally taken by thought, isn't it? But if you introduce something in, in another, uh, unrelated to your thinking process, like this meaningless mantra, and you just repeat that sound, even if you just say it half a dozen times, for those few seconds, your attention is not on your thoughts, it's on this mantra. So, you know, the more you give attention to something, the bigger it gets, doesn't it? It magnifies. The more you think about your problem, the bigger it gets. But if you think about something else, what happens? It gets less. Because the attention is really the life force that gives things life. So if you turn your attention to something else, your thinking is diminished. This is how meditation works. You know, I bet when people eat their dinner, they're usually thinking a bit less. Because most of us like our food, don't we? <laughs> It diverts the attention for things. This is how meditation works. You never try to get rid of thoughts. You can't do that. But you put in an alternative. And as you listen to this alternative, your thoughts simply recede into the background because they're not being attended to. And you follow this mantra. And to begin with, it's quite difficult to do it. You, you may only listen to two or three times and you forget it. You go back into thinking. And then you remember, come back to the mantra. And if you listen to the mantra with 100% attention, which is well nigh impossible to begin with, then you've no more attention left for thoughts, have you? That's how it works. You begin to understand the nature of time. That worldly time is from here to there, isn't it? But this stillness is eternal. It doesn't change, does it? It's here, it's in France, it's in Australia. The same stillness unchanging, always now. It's absolutely crucial to be present. Because when we are really present, feet on the floor, bottom on the chair, it's an amazing thing. You just look and listen. You'll find you've forgotten to think. Your mind is quiet. You're suddenly filled with beauty and happiness. You wonder why we ever leave it. Just by being here now. Then, oh, back we go into, you know, looking at the watch. Well, this is, this is what's called work. This is the spiritual work. Sometimes it's a battle. It's the un unseen battle to overcome the powers of darkness and to let in the light. It's not abnormal at all to completely forget about the body and the mind. You can't really describe what happens because you go beyond description. But afterwards you know that there is nothing but nothing in this world to compare with where you've been and what you've, what you've been shown. I referred to levels of consciousness, didn't I? There are levels of knowledge. If you can describe it, it isn't it. You see, because description, the moment you describe something, you put a limit around it. You know, this is a stone, this is a dog, this is a tree. 
in real experience, funnily enough, you can't really describe space, can you? Or stillness, or peace, or love, or freedom. Yet we all use these words every day, don't we? And no one can describe it. We don't really know what we don't know what they are. We can experience it, but it, we can't capture it within our thinking mind and describe it. So it's said that real knowledge is not something we learn by description. It comes from revelation. You know, there are books and books and books and books written all about wonders and this and that. Well, they're just words and descriptions, but it, nothing compares to the actual experience. When you, when you know wonders, we don't need books to tell you. Because when we try to give an answer out of our heads, we, we nearly always get it wrong. But if you just look at the sky, what happens? You sort of just expand and melt into it, don't you? That's what happens. You just melt into it. You just forget yourself. And you just melt into that, that freedom. That It cannot hurt you. It's most merciful. You and I don't know. God knows. This is profoundly true. Two things have no limit, the foolishness of man and the mercy of God. Those are well-known words from Scripture, aren't they? My ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It's alarming, it's tragic. It should fire up anybody who heeds what I say to take this work seriously, dead seriously. Because this raising of consciousness, which is what it really is, which, which you can also call prayer, this raising of consciousness truly is salvation. It saves us from this pit of darkness or ignorance, which is called the world. There's no phrase, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The flesh, of course, is, is corrupted by this fall from spirit where there's no body. You don't need a body up there. Um, look, this, this stillness doesn't have, a, doesn't have this, does it? You leave it behind on the seat when you meditate. And this, of course, will die. You see, we're, we're dealing with fragments, with this little bits of it, little bits of this and that, which are marvelous when you, you got it until they pass. And this world does come to pass because it's, it's, it's governed by what you can call passing time, temporal time. The real world is eternal. This is eternal. Clouds come and go. The seasons come and go. Everything in this world comes to pass. That's the nature of this world. So the world, the flesh, and then the devil, what's the devil? The devil is the ego, the I, me, or mine, which describes our separation. A very, very good clue, I repeat, is whenever our tongue, which is a mischievous creature, beware of the tongue, whenever the tongue says I, I think or I want, or me, or mine, beware. You've got to sort of, what we can't change, we have to endure. You, know, you live with it. Of course, there's much I don't know. Well, what can we take with us beyond the grave? That's really a good question. What can I take with me beyond the grave? Everything else we leave behind. See, I can tell you, when you reach my age, it's only too obvious. But you see, the more we can open up this dimension of spirit, then the emphasis of the body and the ego gets less. So it's a matter of balance. You, you take, it's a step in one direction and you begin to get a sense of, of what it is to get another dimension to life. And that begins to put this into proportion. It's no longer so total. The flesh is no longer the whole scene. There's more to life than meets the eye. And also, of course, that's talking about the fleshly eye, isn't it? The eye of flesh, which sees flesh. But the eye of spirit sees spirit. So meditation is really a process of surrendering me 
And when you surrender me, without any me in the way, without any impediment of me, you're just free, aren't you? Withdrawal is the very last thing it is. What you do, you expand. You may take a step backwards. Look, when you climb the hill up from the market down in the valley, you come up here and then you look down. The market's still there. You haven't rejected it. You're going back down there for your lunch in a few minutes, aren't you? You're going to sleep there. But you just take a step back and get a, get a higher point of view. Feel refreshed. And then you come down into the world again and carry on with your daily life. Yes, I know in some religious traditions that people have sort of shut themselves away from the world, shut it out. The world can seem uh, in opposition to the spirit. Well, look at the sky. The sky doesn't reject the world, does it? The sky just contains it. The sun shines on everybody. That's meditation. Meditation's like merging in the sky. You just contain everything. And if you receive what one might call blessings in meditation, then what happens? They just flow, don't they? So it's actually for everyone. If you switch on the light, it shines everywhere, doesn't it? We are afraid, and some people, of course, are terrified to stop talking. Afraid of silence, and let alone space. <laughs> and, um, well, um, yes, it takes a bit of getting used to it if you're not used to it. And fear is one of the things we have to overcome. But it much depends on how determined you are, how, how much you want to be free. Well, yes, I've known a lot of, of so let's say, little depressions <laughs> in my life. Um, mostly to do with the circumstances of my life. I have been depressed about the state of the world, about uh, land misuse. That's what inspired me to farm the way I did. I was one of the first organic farmers. But the real depression, which lasted several years, occurred when I was 47, after a great love experience, which really, um, turned me upside down. I suppose you could say it altered the course of my life. In a sense, it was unrequited. It was, uh, you know, we, we were never together and it only lasted a few months. But uh, what I saw in this woman, if you remember what I told you about my first practice of meditation, when it all opened up, when I looked into this woman's eyes, I saw something rather similar. I saw the infinite. And of course with her it wasn't so much space, it was infinite beauty, infinite love. And uh, in contrast, everything else seemed like a shadow. And I knew that was what I wanted. Of course, that was in a human frame, and therein lies the difficulty, because I was still a man, she was a woman, we were both married. How do you reconcile the two? Well, that took a long time. I began to see that, that this infinite experience was the only thing I really wanted in life, and that I put all my eggs into that basket, and because, of course, the world does not allow it. The world, I mean, I was still a man. I still had human feelings, didn't I? You can't just suddenly opt out of those. The world doesn't fit the infinite vision. I was utterly lost. I left my farm. I left my wife. I, uh, I wandered for several years, not really knowing where to go or what to do. So I know a lot about depression and despair. Yes, the world is full of good advice, isn't it? I often think one of the most practical things is simply go out for a walk, open the window, because this is, you see, this is hell, isn't it? Me, me and my problems. Whereas even just to get up and open the window is a help, isn't it? See there are other people out there.
Some of them even worse than you are, in a worse state. Well, as they say, time heals. Sometimes you just got to stick it out. Like the weather, sometimes you just got to wait a, wait a bit. Yes, there comes, there are times when all the words in the world, all the good advice in the world really mean nothing. Mercifully, uh, things come to pass, both the good and the bad. And for most of us, sometime in life, the, the clouds do pass. Get outside. If, and this has always been my number one rescue. Get outside. I love to try to see some grass and green things every day. Even better, go a bit further. You know, think of the help that even a little dog is to lonely old people living at a dog or a cat. You know, a lot of little things like that are absolute lifelines, aren't they? And then one thing leads to another. The human condition is as it is, isn't it? And uh, fortunately, there is this, I call it an inner compass, that we nearly all want to love and be loved, don't we? We want to be happy. We want to feel sufficient. Mm. Most of us want peace. Well, love and peace and freedom are, are enough. If you've got anything of that in you, then gradually you'll work. But my dears, on a day like this, it's just so simple, isn't it? <laughs> just look at that lovely blue sky. And doesn't everyone just love to lie on their backs on a day like this and just look at the sky? You don't have to teach them to do it. It's just natural. And people love it. Because actually, it is love. It's like our invisible arms, isn't it? That never criticizes us, never judges us, is never unkind. It just contains us. The spirit doesn't hurt the world, but it just, you see, the world's like a dream. It's not as real as we think. And what happens to a dream when we wake up in the morning? It just, it's gone, isn't it? But that's what happens to the world. This world comes to pass. It's not as real as we think. The world is mortal. Anything that dies isn't it. Real is what doesn't change. All these things are very gradual. You get moments of insight. I mean, it's very common. Almost everybody has this in their life. If you ask someone, anyone, when were you happy? Almost everybody will give you an answer. Often, years and years ago, often when they were children. Then suddenly, without knowing why, they were just happy. And if you ask them to describe it, they'll usually give you an answer which describes being present. And just, just seeing the sunshine, or just by the seaside, just seeing the waves, or just stroking a dog, just suddenly feeling the touch of the dogs or the look in the dog's eyes. These are moments of insight. And amazingly, people remember them all their lives. Because those are the real moments when we've actually touched on what's real in life. Spiritual work, meditation, for example, gradually, gradually, enables one to have more of these moments. More and more for longer periods. And gradually they merge and... I don't know if anyone ever really is 100% like that all the time. I'm certainly not. But certainly your periods of darkness are less and your periods of light are, are more. Thank God there is... It's said that we have a soul which is, of course, that divine spark, that part, that uh, light that lights every man. And uh, if we work to save our soul, then there is hope for us. I tell you how you can get an indication, you see, is um, perhaps the way I, way, way I speak, or the way I, uh, uh, it's a demonstration, isn't it? When something is real to you, uh, your words tend to, as they say, ring true. 
even if it's silence, there may be a light, a sort of a, a completeness. If you ask me how I am these days, that's my answer, complete, complete.